Hi guys, welcome back. The next topic we're studying is Maestran Gravis. It's an autoimmune disorder, type 2 hypersensitivity, a post-junctional disorder where the antibodies to acetylcholine receptor would be causing a decreased efficiency of neuromuscular transmission. Now, because in this condition, extraocular muscles are involved rather early and uh, one of the classical early presentation of the disease would be development of ptosis and diplopia. Therefore, I'm beginning this topic by describing two named eye signs seen in this condition. In the first one, you will tell the patient that uh, I want you to imagine that you're playing a hide and a seek game. And as kids, when we play hide and seek game, we, we uh, ask the person to close his eyes as tightly as he or she can. I'm trying to test the power of the orbicularis oculi muscle. And you will notice that because in this condition, there's a decremental response. There is a, a progressive uh, myasthenic fatigue that will set in. So when the patient is trying to close his eyes as tight as he can, because there is a muscle fatigue that comes in in between, the eyes would just open. As you can see, uh, it is looking as if the patient is trying to take a peek here while he's trying to close his eyes as tightly as he can. So the first image that I've shown here before you is peak sign. And in the second one, you can notice in the first image presence of ptosis in these patients. In fact, the ptosis that is seen in Maestra Gravis is always asymmetrical. And it's the asymmetrical ptosis that explains the development of diplopia. Now, on whichever eye, there's a predominant ptosis that is being noticed by you. You will use your thumb or finger to elevate that eye. And you will notice that when you're trying to elevate this totic eye, the contralateral eye would fall down like a curtain. And therefore, I've described before you is a classical curtain sign seen in patients of Maestra Gravis. And uh, with this introduction, because there is a progressive muscle fatigue present in this condition or uh, a classical term on repetitive nerve stimulation test that would always be described would be a decremental response. And though I'll be describing the electrodiagnostic tests in detail, we'll talk about single fiber electromyography as well as repetitive nerve stimulation test. But the point is that there is a, this disease has a characteristic fluctuating course and the manifestations of the neurological symptoms would be exhibiting a diurnal variation. Why that's important is because I can say that in neurology, either you have symptoms or you do not have symptoms. But in this case, what is happening is that the symptoms of the patient may not be present in the morning hours. It is with, with fatigue, like this person is an office going person when he starts working on his computer when his extraocular muscles are undergoing stress at that point of time diplopia would start coming in and this person would then you know maybe close his eyes to give rest to the muscles i mean that's what the patient is going to explain you and the patient says that the moment i closed my eyes sitting in front of my computer my boss just walked in and he says my heart was in my mouth my boss is looking at me i'm sitting in front of the computer with my eyes closed and my boss thinks that i am chilling out and he's not understanding that my eye muscles get tired very soon and if i do not close my eyes and give rest i start seeing double so a lot of these patients might actually tell you that you know they are having an occupational problem they would tell you that at their work their colleagues or their boss have called them a sleepy head because these patients are trying to give rest to their eye muscles and you know at that point of time the boss just walked in and he or she thought the boss thought that this person is trying to take a, a break from work so diurnal variation of symptoms would be always described in a patient of myasthenia gravis uh, though you will also read about uh, diurnal variation of neurological symptoms in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, but the pattern that would be seen would be grossly different from what we're going to encounter in Maestra and Gravis. Uh, and more importantly, I mean, this disorder has a motor weakness. And along with this motor weakness, you will also notice a very characteristic finding that is the deep tendon reflexes in this patient would be normal. This would help you in MCQs in a sense that, uh, you know, uh, in this condition, we do have uh, a variant, you know, that's called an anti-musk antibody. And patients who are having an anti-musk antibody predominantly tend to have a bulbar involvement or can be having a facial weakness. And uh, you could easily be, you know, uh, if a patient presents with bulbar weakness, facial weakness, and then subsequently arm weakness, you could, and asymmetrical arm weakness, more importantly, you could be misdiagnosing or thinking in terms of motor neuron disease as well. But in case a patient is having motor neuron disease where there's a bulbar involvement present, there's an arm weakness present, you would always have reflexes getting affected. Even in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, deep tendon reflexes would always be either reduced or would be absent, but they are normal in patients of Maestra Gravis. And as the disease will progress, 
then there would be a complement mediated damage to the post i mean i did say the fact it's a post junctional disorder you all know that but what i'm adding now is that in these patients there's a complement mediated damage which also tells us that why eclusimab will be working in these patients because it's going to block the complement mediated damage and this complement mediated damage tends to cause flattening of the post synaptic cleft see the post synaptic cleft or the post synaptic area is attacked by complement now we have, you know, a wavy appearance. Every time we see a structure of the neuromuscular junction, uh, though I'll be showing you the image of the neuromuscular junction as well, but right from your basic biology days, every time they show you a synaptic cleft and then a postsynaptic area, the postsynaptic cleft would be having undulations present and these undulations would be damaged. The total surface area available for acetylcholine is going to reduce. See, receptors are going to be damaged, that's okay, but the surface area available for acetylcholine to act will also be reduced. So there is a postsynaptic membrane damage in this condition, and this postsynaptic membrane damage results in development of blunting of uh, the postsynaptic membrane, and I can describe this blunting effect uh, uh, parallel to what we read in celiac sprue. You know, just like in celiac sprue, you read that there is a flattening of the villi. And uh, in a similar sense, I'm trying to say that here I'm not talking about villi, I'm talking about the surface area of the postsynaptic cleft. And what I'm saying is there's a complement mediated damage which causes uh, local damage, and therefore the surface area available for acetylcholine to act where the receptors are going to be expressed, where there's going to be clustering of the receptors will also go down. And in fact, this what I'm saying, the blunting and the damage, the complement mediated uh, damage to the postsynaptic membrane explains the burnt out stage of myasthenia gravis. What I mean by burnt out stage is that initially when you're going to prescribe pyridostagement in the early phase of the disease, it's going to show a beautiful result. But the same patient after a couple of years might actually start developing fasciculations instead of getting benefit and increased in muscle power, the patient will start complaining of fasciculations because as they progress from the active inflammatory stage to the burnt out stage, that's when we start noticing that the drug is not having its effect. Though we have good immune therapy available for management of these patients and as of now about 20% of these patients can go into remission. 20% patients of myasthenia gravis might go into remission and may not require any medication. I mean we may be able to even temporarily, I'm saying temporarily even stop all immune mediated or immunotherapy in these patients. As all autoimmune disorders, I mean, all autoimmune disorders tend to have a waxing and a waning course. So there is a possibility that this person can deteriorate someday due to occult infection and can go into myasthenic crisis. But the point is we can see remission with a properly timed immune therapy used for management of these patients. And in case this is not done, then these patients will progress to a burnt out stage where the post synaptic membrane would be damaged. And this is going to result in the space available. I mean, the, the area where the acetylcholine receptors are expressed is going to be lesser. As a result of it, the efficiency of drugs would also tend to reduce. And uh, because in this condition, there is always a fluctuating weakness, the symptoms are not going to be present in the morning. The symptoms are going to come when the patient is going to fiddle around with his smartphone and he's playing maybe a video game on his mobile phone, him or him or her. I mean, most of the time, you know, autoimmune disorders are more common in women. So when it's going to be a 20, 30 year old patient of Maestra Garavich, it's mainly going to be a woman. And if it's a 50, 60 year old patient, then most of the time it's going to be a male. I mean, female to male ratio for the disorder is about three to two. But the point is, in these patients, you will always have a fluctuating weakness. When the patient is fiddling around with his mobile phone, playing a video game or working on a computer, watching television, that is when the symptoms are going to develop. And when the person will sleep or give rest, that is when the symptoms are going to disappear. And as I said, the patient was trying to give rest to her eyes while sitting in front of the computer screen and the boss just thought that this person is a sleepy head so a lot of time i mean these patients might be having problems with their occupation where they are where they're expected to be you know totally focused on work and this person is trying to give rest to eyes and that is when i mean it can be an embarrassing situation for the patient at that particular point of time the moment I said this fluctuating weakness, I also want to bring to your notice that uh, if you're going to perform a repetitive nerve stimulation test in these patients at a low frequency of 2 to 3 hertz, you will notice a progressive decline. The, the amplitude of decline is about a more than 10%, though the mathematical values I'll be writing subsequently. But uh, whatever I've said, the symptoms are not there in the morning. And as you're working, the symptoms tend to uh, progressively develop. So because I use the word fluctuating, 
fluctuating weakness the mathematical uh, definition of that fluctuating weakness would be or the mathematical way he'll describe this in the book or a technical way he'll describe it in the book would be a decremental response of more than 10 percent when it comes to the amplitude of the action potential that would be derived with respect to repetitive nerve stimulation the best electrodiagnostic test for this condition is single fiber electromyography Though if it is not available, then repetitive nerve stimulation test would be the second best answer when it comes to electrodiagnosis of this condition. And moreover, we have antibodies present here. And one of the main antibodies is anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. Let's look at what this antibody will do. Part number three is the easiest one to remember and understand that this would be causing a blockade of the acetylcholine receptor. I'll be describing the normal structure of the acetylcholine receptor also, the couple of units also, the subunits present here like alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So most of the time it's the alpha subunit which is affected. So blockade of the acetylcholine receptor at the active site is what is going to be responsible for why we are going to call it a post-junctional defect. The second reason uh, why you have, uh, I mean, the manifestations of a decremental response in this patient is the damage to the postsynaptic membrane. In fact, uh, this damage to the postsynaptic membrane would be, uh, if it is not handled with immune therapy, the amount of damage that occurs here results in a burnt out stage where you may not get any benefit out of giving pyridostigmine to the patient. And uh, this is in collaboration with complement. I mean, the damage is in collaboration with the complement system. And since it is complement mediated, that is why nowadays uh, eclusimab infusions, though they would be expensive, would be beneficial for the patient. And the first point is rather only for the sake of an MCQ that the antibody will also cause an accelerated turnover of the receptors. What he means by the accelerated turnover of the receptors is that there is a rapid endocytosis of the receptors. When you look at the word endocytosis, that tells you that there is going to be a uh, increased clearance of the receptors also. Uh, he might even use these terms like cross-linking of the receptor. So there are three because nowadays the questions would be integrated in the pathophysiology component. There are three points to be remembered. One, the point number two part is anyway the critical one in a sense that this would result in if this is not taken care of, it's going to result in a burnt out stage. And one and three, well, they explain the post junctional defect and the decremental response, specifically the rapid endocytosis of receptors, the cross-linking of the receptors, as a result of which they're not able to do their normal activity. And moreover, if the active site, I mean, it's, a, it's like adding insult to the fire uh, or adding fire to the insert, like whichever way, the point is uh, there is a blockade of acetylcholine receptor at its active site. 